Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the last Tuesday. Of, no, no, it's well, it is the last Tuesday, but it's really the fourth Tuesday of the month because we go by different weeks, which means it's time for Move Well to Age Well with Eileen Kapsoftis. And today she's going to talk about swinging. No, get your mind out of the gutter. Not that kind of swinging, the kind you do in sports. And I'm anxious to hear what she says because I can no longer play pickleball since I tore my rotator cuff. So maybe she's going to be able to explain how I did it and how I could have avoided that injury. Please welcome Eileen Kapsoftis. Thank you, AJ. I didn't know you were a pickleball fan. So Well, I was because everybody in the desert played and it was like every day and it was just, I mean, I would play for three hours and then I tore the cuff. It took, I didn't have to have, I mean, I could have had surgery, but I don't like surgery. So it took a year and a half with rehab to heal. And then the doctor said, don't play anymore. So I didn't because I don't want to go through that again. So tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, there is, there's a lot to what the body does when we are swinging anything, um, even if it's an ax to chop wood, whether it's a bat to hit a baseball or pulling the arm back to throw a baseball, a baseball pitcher or a softball pitcher or Frisbee. It, it all requires the body to load and unload. And a lot of the times what happens, unfortunately, um, and this is based on not really fully understanding the mechanics of the body and how everything's connected to everything else, but people will focus on, as they did for you, they focused on your shoulder, at least I'm kind of guessing based on what you just shared, that everybody focused on getting your shoulder rehabbed. But did anybody look at what happened with your trunk when you were playing pickleball? What happened with your pelvis? How about your ankles? Any history of ankle injuries or sprains? And I'm not asking you to share your personal information. Oh, no, I, don't, I don't mind sharing, but you know, I was just talking to my husband the other day that up until like my mid thirties, I would constantly sprain or break my ankles. And I don't know yeah. why I haven't done it in a while. Thank goodness. Okay. Okay. So, so you're going to, you're going to like this one, AJ. I, I think I must've just done this for you and I didn't know it. So <laughs> nice. Hopefully. All right. I'm going to share my screen and, and I don't have a lot of slides today. I think like, I don't know, seven or eight of them. Uh, I'm not going to show any anatomy per se, but I just want people to see some pictures and get a basic understanding of what's going on with these things. And then I'll go downstairs and I will teach some movements that can maybe help people to perform these things better, or at least kind of see what may be going wrong. So let me share my screen here. There we are. And hopefully everybody can see this. And so this is swing with power instead of pain. It, it also could be throw with power instead of pain. If you happen to be a baseball pitcher and watching this, or you have a grandson or someone uh, or a child who does these kind of things. So it'll just get you thinking, hopefully, about the mechanics of the body and what's required. And ideally, people will stop putting a microscope on that one body part that has pain or injury and start pull back and look at the whole picture so that things can be resolved in a, in a much more effective fashion. So uh, this information again is educational purposes only. I know I share this every single time. I'm not telling anyone what to do. Don't, don't ignore what your doctor said. Don't do anything you know that you should not do. Make sure that you're, you're talking with a professional uh, before you apply anything that I'm sharing here, I don't want anyone to get hurt. I don't know what's going on in your world. I'm not in your living room or wherever you are watching this, and I don't know anything about you. So I don't. I never, ever, ever want anyone to be harmed by anything I teach. So you need to use wisdom here and be sure everything's okay. Um, but this is this is my mantra, if you want to use that term. Understanding authentic human movement leads to better training choices with improved results. And that's what it's all about. If you want to be able to swing a golf club and do it well with power and accuracy and no pain, then understanding how many areas of the body are required for this to happen is important. Now, I am not a golf coach. I'm not a sports coach. I actually had somebody contact me and ask me if I would coach their son. I said, I don't coach. What I do is I teach human biomechanics. I assess the person's movement and I tell them what's going wrong. Now, we, I was in a clinic for many years, a decade, where we were across from the local high school. So we did deal with a lot of teenage athletes who'd been injured. 
And the parents, they would pay attention to what I was teaching these kids and explaining to them when we figured out why their shoulder hurt uh, because they had sprained their ankle a year before. And the coach had said, okay, come back into the game. You're fine. No more pain. You can do everything. Nothing's hurting. You're stable. You're not um, losing your balance, any of that stuff. And so the athlete and the parents, everybody agreed and they went back to the game. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, uh, an expert in movement had not assessed the ankle and ensured that it was fully everting, fully inverting, fully dorsiflexing, fully pronating and supinating. And was it able to change from one position to another with the speed that whatever their activity required it to do? So because of that, there were compensations that were going on in their body. And so whenever they went to uh, do a, a soccer kick or whenever they went to throw a, a baseball or swing a tennis racket or um, run down the court with the basketball, whatever sport they were in, football, whatever, the ankle was not performing properly and the body was compensating because of that lack. And whatever body part they had to use a lot it would get injured, stressed, really unhappy because it was doing things it wasn't designed to do to make up for the lack at the ankle below. So it's really important that we understand looking at our bodies from the ground up, especially when we're doing something that's really physical, because almost always, like you even shared, AJ, you had a history of multiple ankle sprains, very unstable ankles. And so that's gonna impact whatever you do physically and it's important to address that and get that to work as well as possible so that whatever else you want to do is not impeded or potentially harmed because of that lack below. So I'm going to go into a few things here. I'm not going to go heavy in, in, into this. Uh, anybody who wants to know more about the nitty gritties of this, I write about this regularly in my monthly newsletter. I believe there's a link somewhere when I've been a guest with AJ. And so you'll see a link. You can sign up for the newsletter. But this was some information that I had shared. I believe this was back in January. And I was talking about physics. And it's really important to understand just how much physics impacts human movement. You've got gravity, which we all know. If, if you step off a curb, you're going to go down. You're not going to float up. Ground reaction force, a lot of people have never heard of that, but that is the, the ground is actually providing a force equal to the mass on top of it. And then there's mass and momentum. Mass is, is the weight of your body and momentum is how fast is your body moving. And so I, I'm gonna explain each of these just a little bit more detail. So gravity, we need to understand how it impacts human movement, as I said. And it's, if you, if you and, and even with posture, if you habitually put your head down and you put it forward, maybe not even down, but you put it forward, a lot of people get into a real, I, I want to say bad habit of looking down when they're walking. And ideally, when you look ahead, your vision is still seeing the ground in front of you. Now, if you're carrying something that's different, you may be blocking your view and God forbid you'll trip on something or, or not see something on the ground, which isn't good. So then looking down, if you're carrying something is a good idea. Usually I'll put it to my side, especially if I'm carrying downstairs. But you want to you don't want to be always having your head forward because now gravity is going to start to I, I almost want to say pull your head down. Because yes, gravity impacts your body. Every single day activities, those daily activities, gravity impacts you a lot more than you might think. Even during a swinging activity, swinging a club, swinging a baseball, swinging a pickleball racket, gravity impacts you. And then that ground reaction force, it, it's, um, it's actually Newton's third law for those of you who are, are a little bit of a geek in the science. And you can state it like this, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so the ground reaction force is that force that the ground exerts on whatever's in contact with it. So when you're standing still, ground reaction force, it kind of just corresponds with your body weight because you're standing still. When you move, that ground reaction force increases to match the speed of your movement. So how fast you're moving, the ground reaction force literally changes. And when you run, it increases up to two to three times your body weight, which I think is really cool. And why does it matter that we know this? Well, 
if you're just walking, ground reaction force is more than your body weight at the beginning when you land on your heel and the end when you push off your toe of a step. But surprisingly, it's a lot less when you're in the middle of taking the step, when you're in what's called a mid stance and your weight is just kind of evenly distributed on the foot. Now, it's important to know this when you're seeking answers for pain during an activity so that you'll address the actual cause of the issue and not just treat the symptom. And this is why my book is titled Pain Culprits, because a lot of the times we're beating up the victim and we don't even realize there's a culprit lurking somewhere that we haven't sought out that we're not addressing. So now to bring this whole thing back to a swinging activity, when you create that needed motion for your sport, whatever it is, your body's always providing this equal and opposite reaction due to that ground reaction force during the movement. So when you swing the pickleball racket, if you're swinging it with your left hand to prepare for a backhanded swing, so if I'm if I'm going to do a backhanded swing, I'm going to bring it this way, so I'm going to rotate to my right, my left leg is pushing into the ground with an equal force. So what happens if there's something going on with my left foot, with my left ankle, with my left knee, with my left hip? That force is going to be impacted. It's going to be impeded. It's not going to be optimal. And that's going to impact my ability to do a really good backswing or to load eccentrically before that, which I'll talk about in a minute. So you, you need to be able to, to use your whole body when you're on your feet, when you're doing any sport activity. And some of them require a lot more things than others. And then the mass and momentum. Your body has mass, obviously. We're, we're taking up space. We have mass. And if it's moving, it has momentum. And the greater the mass, so the larger the body, think about a snowball when it rolls downhill, the bigger the snowball gets, the faster it goes. So, it, um, and this is Newton's first law, and it, it's his law of inertia. And it, that does provide a lot more detail on the topic, but, and you'll read things like a body in motion tends to stay in motion or a body at rest tends to stay at rest. Who's ever been on the sofa and didn't feel like getting up? That's inertia. <laughs> it's the last thing you want to do sometimes. But these things are important to understand when we study human movement. So when your body's moving during the swing, whatever sport you're involved in, that motion continues until you physically stop it to move in the opposite direction. So when I'm getting ready to do a backswing with that pickleball racket, I'm going to come forward. I'm going to go in this direction, but I'm going to stop it at the right time. And then I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And it's needed to control that motion. And if you're struggling to control that motion, that often exposes any deficits in performance in the human body. All right, so load to unload. As I mentioned previously, uh, I was going to talk about eccentric loading. And this is when your body controls a motion to prepare for a change in direction from the initial motion. So you can see here this pitcher. This is the pitcher's prayer. He's getting ready to pull that arm back. Look how far back he's going before he throws it forward. So he is loading in order to unload. And the better that he loads, the better he unloads. When you swing your leg forward to take a step, when you're walking, there are muscles that control that swing forward so that you can perform a heel strike. So your heel can hit the ground and begin moving your leg in the opposite direction, going backward. When you swing a club, a racket, a bat, your body controls the swing to hopefully stop it at the right time and then swing in the opposite direction. I don't know if you've ever noticed that you first swing in the opposite direction of what you're attempting to hit. You probably never even thought about it. And, and I kind of want to joke a little bit here, but there, the, the thing about throwing a ball like a girl and, and I've, I've, never done that. And I know there's a lot of female athletes who have, have never really thrown like a girl, but there are some people, no matter what, will throw that way. And the reason they're throwing that way is because they're not loading first to unload. 
They're not going in the opposite direction with enough movement to create power so that when they unload, the ball goes somewhere. So that's what's happening. If you desire to hit a golf ball forward, you first swing your arms and the club backward. And that's for any swinging sport, even a Frisbee. If I want the Frisbee to go forward, I need to pull it backward first. So, and when you putt, when you putt a golf ball, you only bring your club back a little bit because you don't want, you don't want a lot of power. You want more accuracy. You're, you're hitting it very gently. And the same thing would be if you, you wanted to um, bunt the baseball. They're not coming way back to swing through. They're just, they're, they're just coming up and they're tapping it. There's no back. There's no eccentric load when you don't want a lot of power behind it. But if you do want a lot of power behind it, you're going to take a full swing backward first. If, if you want to drive a ball 200 yards on a golf course, you need a full, full backswing. So, and you know, baseball pitchers, they throw a 90 mile an hour pitch. They're not just going like this. They're doing what this guy's doing here. They're really loading to unload. So just whenever high speed is required or power is required, eccentric load is always necessary first in any activity that requires power. So do you have an ankle sprain history? A lot of people do. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with people in a clinic setting or doing consults on Zoom for years and years who have a history of an ankle sprain and they're they're they kind of get this deer in headlights look when they realize that their their hip issue or their shoulder issue or their neck issue or their knee issue and I'm not saying 100% of the time it's because somebody has an ankle issue but it's it's really common a lot more common than you think and you've got to you've got to resolve that if you don't resolve it no matter what you're doing on your feet isn't going to be optimal because there's something below that's lacking. Whether it's mobility, whether it's stability, it needs to be restored. So I just wanted to show you this. There is, unfortunately, you can't really see her foot position here in the, the follow through, the, the end of the swing, but you can see, look how much she's loading here in order to swing that club with power and hopefully accuracy. That's going to count on a lot of things, whether the, the pelvis is squared off, whether the ankles and the knees are doing what they're meant to do. But at the very end of a golf swing, it's fascinating just how much ankle motion is required. And if any of you are golfers, you've probably heard of Sam Snead. He was a top golfer for 40 years or more. And he was well known for saying that the, the ankle motion is one of the most important parts of a, of a healthy, accurate, powerful golf swing. And so, I mean, look at here at the end of this swing, look at what this ankle's doing and look at what this ankle's doing. It almost looks like he's going to sprain his ankle. And I'll show you a close up here. Doesn't that almost look like an ankle sprain? Golfers move their feet faster than any other part of their body and golf. And I find this fascinating and I'm not even a golfer, but I love watching human biomechanics. I love learning and studying human biomechanics. It's kind of, it's like, it's why I'm here breathing. And so when I look at this golf is it, I'm got to say this right. Golf requires more motion and ability in the ankle than any other sport. Any other sport. Because of this. Look at this. This is inversion. This is an inversion sprain waiting to happen. But obviously, really good golfers do this all day long. They don't sprain themselves. They don't injure themselves. What if someone has a history of an ankle sprain? That ankle's never going to get into that position, which is required at the end of a healthy golf swing in order for power and accuracy. It's required. So it's, it's fascinating. And then you've got all these other sports. Now, 
In golf, you're in one still position when you're hitting the ball. So you're not running. You're not changing position with your feet. They're staying on the ground, but they're doing a lot of movement and a lot of mobility is required. But these other sports, you're running around at the same time that you're swinging your arms. And so it's going to be a little more, you know, might not be as accurate as trying to hit a tiny little ball 200 yards in in an accurate direction, but it does require those ankles to do a lot. It also requires the hips, the pelvis, the trunk, the shoulders to do a lot. But if you're having an issue, if you're having pain in just one position, in, in one activity, uh, or you injured yourself while you were doing it, I've worked with a lot of private consults who have um, wanted to return to playing tennis or return to pickleball or return to golf because they love it, but they had pain, they had an injury, whatever, and they couldn't do it. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with pickleball, it's really become the rage now for a while. It's kind of a mix of tennis and badminton and badminton and ping pong all together. And the court is smaller than a tennis court. So it's easier on the knees because you're not having to run as, it's, you're, it's not as big of an area to have to cover. Uh, so it's a little bit easier on the knees and the hips than tennis and other court sports like basketball. So it's it's more user-friendly for people who may not be as athletically fit as some people. So, but it's it can be it can be a really good game. I'm not saying that it doesn't require a lot of athleticism. And then, you know, tennis, even if you're a beginning tennis player, you still you want your body to be performing from the ankles up in order to be able to swing the tennis racket without injuring your your elbow, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow. It's not the elbow. It's the rest of the body not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And the elbow is the victim. And so many people, they're getting injections or they're getting PT. I can't tell you how many people came to PT to, you know, get some ultrasound and whatever else would, would be recommended, stretching and, and, and hand exercises and wrist exercises and all the other nonsense. And, and I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but that's not the, the elbow's not the cause. It's the victim. So, and then Frisbee. And then I was surprised when I was doing some updated research, badminton, has become a real professional sport. I could have showed you some pictures. These these people flying up in the air playing badminton. It's crazy. Nothing like when I was a kid out in the backyard at, at Aunt Wilma's. So, but um, but these sports are fun when your body's performing properly. Not so fun when your body's not performing properly. So this again, just a reminder, you're you're gonna wind up in order to follow through. You're getting that big back motion before you can release with power. In order to throw a ball 90 something miles per hour, you need to load first. In order to hit in pickleball, tennis, badminton, baseball, you need to go in the opposite direction first to load. Those foot, and, the feet and ankles need to be stabilizing you and providing the motion required from the ground up in order for you to be able to do the game without harming yourself. And this is the last slide. I just wanted to show you this. I actually created a very special um, movement video, a movement performance assessment for the golf swing, but you can also take it into account for any other thing. I do have a, a free movement performance assessment that's your basic three plane assessment and uh, what I did was I created a video where I talk about the golf swing. And when I show the same movements that are in the movement performance in, in the MPA, I'm talking about how it impacts the golf swing. That's all. That's the only difference. And I'm thinking I might do it for other sports as well. So people have an idea. It's, it sounds more like what they're looking for. But um, this is this will be released. This video will be released early next week. But I wanted to share it with you now. If you go to this website, swingwithpower.com, you can register and you'll get an email that will tell you when it's ready to come and watch and check it out. And it's all free. So I just thought you guys would, um, would uh, enjoy that. All right. So 
Now what I'm going to do is I am going to go downstairs and I want to teach you probably three or four different movements that may help you if you're having issues and sort of get your body playing nice from the ground up. Obviously, I can't you know, diagnose or treat anybody here, but I can show you some things that may help you to be able to do the things you love without pain or fear of injury. So thank you. I'll entertain the troops while you're going from the upper level to the lower level. Okay. Thank you, AJ. Of course. So guys, isn't this amazing? You know, some of the people that watch the show have booked private sessions with her and that help with their back pain and all kinds of things. So that's always available to you. The information is in the show notes. And tomorrow at nine o'clock, we have Dr. Lori Marvis. And then at 10 o'clock, we have a very special session with Dr. Doug Lyle, where he, like Dr. McDougall did today, is giving a very rare talk that they actually lost the video from. So it'll be your only chance to see it be on this channel and for 24 hours unless you upgrade to the summit package. So that's that. I'm sure she Okay. Be I'm here. You can hear me? Perfectly. Okay, perfect. Always nice when technology works, isn't it? Yeah, I tell yeah. me. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. All right. So what I want to do is show you some movements, and then, of course, I'll answer any questions that people may have. But I want to, I want to show you some movements, and these movements are a little bit different, than, uh, depending on how many of my guest spots you've watched. Uh, I've taught a lot of different movements here. I'm going to teach some that are a little bit more geared at improving the golf swing. However, they're also going to help the body to load properly, and then depending on your desired sport, whether it's pickleball or baseball or frisbee, badminton, whatever it is, it's still going to improve your ability to do motions that are required for that activity. So some of them are a little more specific than others, but hopefully you'll like this. So what I want to do is I want to start off with, as you all heard me say, ankles are key. And if you have history of ankle sprains, more than likely, unless a professional has worked with you to restore full motion, more than likely your ankles are not performing the way that you need them to when you are turning to swing and hit something with a racket or, or use a golf club, um, whatever it is that you want to do. So what I'm going to have you start with is where you step forward, but when you step forward, you're going to cross over. And what that's going to do is that's going to alter the position of the ankle that you're standing on. So the foot that moves isn't necessarily the, the part of the body that's going to be impacted as much, although you do have to land well when you come forward. But when you land, you're also going to rotate. And so what that's going to do is that's going to pull your ankle into a supinated position and in the back foot and then the front foot, it's gonna go into a pronated position depending on your body and your body's ability to do these things. And the back foot is also gonna be dorsiflex. And I don't want your eyes to glaze over with all these terms because it doesn't really matter if you know any of them as long as you can do the movement. So you want that ankle to be able to come up towards your shin or if the foot's on the ground, you want your shin to be able to come forward over the ankle. That's huge. If that's lacking, which a lot of the time that is lacking when someone has uh, an ankle history issue, a lot of the times dorsiflexin is lacking. And a lot of times that will lead to plantar fasciitis symptoms or some other issue, knees. Knees are such a victim of poor ankle function, it's not even funny. Those poor knees. And so it's really important. Okay, so let me show you the movement. So what you're gonna do, and you're gonna step forward, but you're gonna cross over. Now, for those of you who might be a little bit challenged with balance or stability, I want you to be careful with this. You might wanna hold on to something to be on the safe side because if you can't be on a tight rope and not lose your balance, this is, is gonna make it a little bit more challenging because when you step forward, you're gonna cross over. It's not quite like a tight, tight rope because you do have a little space between the feet and a little bit bigger base of support, but it may still challenge your stability. So uh, 
what you're going to do is you're going to step forward. So I'm going to turn around and show you this. So when I step forward with my right foot, I'm going to step over to my left. So now that's completely changing what's happening with my ankles on the ground. Obviously it's changing what's happening with my hips and we're gonna add a rotation to this. So my right foot is gonna step to my left and I'm gonna rotate left. And there's a lot of reasons for this and I, I don't want you to feel like a deer in headlights and explain all the mechanics of the body, but this improves what the body needs to do to swing a golf club. It'll also improve what the body needs to do to swing pretty much anything, including an ax to chop wood. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna come over here and you're gonna turn. You're gonna come over here and you're gonna turn. And if you have a real issue with balance, you can always go slower so that you're not worried about it. Uh, like I said, you can hold on to something, maybe have the wall in front of you and hold on and turn, although that will limit how much you can turn. Sometimes people do better taking their shoes off because I'm on a squishy floor and my shoes are a little squishy. And so it makes it kind of like you're on a, a foam, which really challenges the balance. But the goal is I'm going to come forward, I'm going to cross over, and I'm going to rotate with my arm. Now we're gonna do the same with the opposite side, of course. The left is gonna cross over and rotate right. And you may notice that you're, it's easier for you to go this way than it is for you to go this way or vice versa. See if there's a difference if you've got some asymmetry, which means one side of the body is working better than the other side of the body. It's important to figure that out because if you've got differences, right side, left side, then your body's compensating all day long. Your brain is not telling you that it's compensating and because it's keeping it a secret and you don't even know it. And that's when those you're compensating and body parts start to break down. They get injured, annoyed, irritated, inflamed because of those compensations. So if you see a big difference between right side, left side of the body, there's some great strategies to to direct, uh, directly uh, address that. Okay, so that's one movement. Another movement is to pre-position your pelvis. And I've got my little cheat sheet here so I don't get off track. So you're pre-positioning your pelvis in rotation and then you're gonna side bend. So this one's pretty basic and this is getting your trunk and your pelvis and your ankles ready to do more than one thing at the same time. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn your pelvis to the left. So you're basically just think about if you've got a flashlight in your belly button and you wanna wave it to your left. So I'm turning left with my pelvis and now I'm gonna side bend to the right using my left arm. I'm gonna go up overhead and I'm gonna to bend to the right. So I'm keeping that position rotated left and then you can do repetitions and you can just side bend to the right. Now, sometimes people do better if they've got a target with that hand. So say I wanna rotate to the left like this, and I'd have to turn a little bit more like this. So rotate left, and then I can take that arm and I can try to tap the wall. But you wanna make sure you're far enough away where you can get a nice side bend. So it gives you a target. It's sometimes a little bit easier to have a target. The brain says, oh, we're trying to touch the wall and it's not confused at what you're trying to do. And then of course the opposite would be rotating to the right. And now my right arm comes overhead, getting closer to the wall here so I can tap it. And then I'm gonna side bend to the left. So these are the things, especially when you are swinging a golf club, you are, if you're a right-handed golfer, you're rotating right, but you're side bending left and your hips are adducting one side, abducting the other, which means the leg is coming in or going out. So there's a, there's, these movements actually mimic those things that are needed. And who knows, if you are a golfer, you might do these repetitively and improve your game. You never know. So, so that's the prepositioning. It's very simple. You're just rotating one way and side bending the other in repetitions. Then we can preposition the pelvis in side bending 
and then rotate. So here, what we would do is say, I'm going to, I think I was gonna start off with a right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to preposition by putting one foot over the other foot. So now I'm side bent to the right. That's, I think you can see that. And obviously it's starting from the ground up. And so if I'm gonna side bend, I'm also going to rotate right. So I'm side bent right. And now I'm gonna take my left arm and I'm gonna reach around. And I'm gonna rotate right. So this is training from the ground up in what's called a type two movement for the trunk but it's also helping the pelvis, the ankles, and every other part of the body to perform better. And then of course you would do the opposite, the left foot would cross over the right. So now I'm left side bent and I'm gonna take my right arm and I'm gonna reach around to rotate left. So that is gonna train both sides. And then notice again, is there an asymmetry? Are you better at one side than the other side? And then the last thing I wanted to show was this is where you're going to um, pre-position your trunk because your trunk is extremely important at everything. Your trunk is between your neck and your low back. And a lot of the times, and I've, I've said this more than once, one of my favorite biomechanics <laughs> teachers, Dr. Gary Gray, is well known for saying the trunk is the silent saboteur because so often the trunk is lacking something, but you don't know it. There's no symptoms there, there's no pain there, but because of the lack in the trunk, the neck is getting trashed or the low back is getting trashed. Uh, on Tuesdays, I do a live academy class and someone in the class this morning actually said that she noticed that she can back up her car a lot easier now because she's been training her trunk. And a lot of the times when people go to turn to back up their car in the driveway, if they struggle, usually they'll have maybe some low back or they'll have some neck or they just can't quite get the motion. Even if there's no pain, it's the trunk. So training the trunk is pivotal no matter what we're doing because it impacts every other area of the body. I mean, think about it. Your legs are coming off the trunk. Your arms are coming off the trunk. Your neck's coming off the trunk. What the trunk does matters. So this is, a, uh, this is a simple movement for the trunk based on the golf swing, but there's a lot of movements that can be done. Just so you know, this is not the only one. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna position uh, for a type two. So what that means is the rotation and the side bending are gonna be to the same direction. So if I'm gonna rotate to the right and side bend to the right, so you can use a wall to hold on to. So if I rotate right and hold onto the wall, and then I side bend right and hold onto the wall, now I can drive the pelvis or the hips, they can go forward and back. And so if those hips go forward, you are training the trunk and the pelvis to work in this type one, type two, sorry, motion, which is required for a lot of sports. Now there's also the type one, which is opposites, but I didn't want anybody to get confused. So now of course we're gonna do it to the other side. So if I take my left hand and I reach behind me, I'm now rotated left. And I take my other hand and reach overhead, I'm now side bent left. So I'm rotated and side bent left. That's type two. And then the same thing, the pelvis goes forward or the hips. Think about driving with the hips. A lot of people have issues anywhere in the body and believe it or not driving emotion with the pelvis can help to create this fluid fill effect this pumping mechanism it's flu you know motion is lotion it's really important that um, if there's pain movement is happening but the the most important thing is that the movement is not painful in repetition and, and I, I drive this home all the time when I work with people or I teach classes or I speak. If repetition is painful, your brain is trying to find a way to stop the pain. So it is using the wrong muscles, the wrong pathways, the wrong way, trying to stop the pain from happening. 
and a person is literally training in dysfunction. So that no pain, no gain thing, that has to do with delayed onset muscle soreness from, from strength training. It's, it's, not, it's not a rehabilitative thing. Now, yes, sometimes if you're rehabilitating and you have to do something, it is painful. If you have a total knee replacement and you start to walk, it's going to hurt. But we're talking here about rehabbing and restoring function in a joint of the body. If you are wanting to fully restore and have be really fit with your function, it's important that what you're doing repetitive is successful without pain and stable. So... Hopefully that makes sense. All right. I'm willing to answer any questions. If anybody has any trouble with oh, yeah. any okay. of that. So let me look in the chat. And I also had, I think there was a, a few that were sent in. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat, starting with four question marks. I know some came in. It may not be on the topic, but it came in with your name. And that would be great if you could answer. Okay. Look under K. All right. I saw it earlier. There it is. Okay. Um, this is from Anonymous. Is it okay to continue to exercise, walk and swim and bike when you have been diagnosed with tendonitis? Well, that's a pretty general question because tendonitis could be anywhere in the body. A tendon is how the muscle attaches to the bone. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of muscles and hundreds of bones. So I don't know where the tendonitis is. And tendonitis, I actually wrote a paper in, uh, on this in the private club that I have online. And tendinosis is, is where there's this thickening and there's this issue going on with the fibers of the tendon. And then tendonitis, anything itis, is considered an inflammation. And for anybody who didn't watch, I think it was the very first guest spot I did uh, with you, AJ, was where I talked about arthritis pain um, and food and movement. And I talked about how food impacts the itises. So if this person is not consuming a healthy whole food plant-based diet, they might want to consider that because there's a lot this, of food. Actually, this, I know who this person is, even though she has to be anonymous oh. and she is pretty Okay. Good. Okay. So, you know so, that. so um, but just for any of the other listeners so that they know that. So it really depends on where the, the pain is, what's going on with the pain. And again, you don't want repetitive constant uh, tendonitis to me it's not really a diagnosis it's a symptom why is that tendon painful why is it not happy with the movement 99.9% .9 of the time it's because there's some other area of the body that's not doing its job so i mean i had a football quarterback who had shoulder and elbow tendonitis diagnosis never touched his shoulder or his elbow because he had nothing wrong there his ankle was completely unstable. And every time he released the football, he was trashing his arm. So when we stabilized his ankles, he could do three hour, three man throws with the football, no shoulder pain, no elbow pain. So depending on where this person is experiencing the tender, tendon pain, it's more than likely reacting to some other body part that's not moving properly. So to answer the question, ideally it would be good to get the body functioning well so that the tendonitis can heal and no longer has to to respond. I mean, you could do bed rest, you could do you could stop doing all your activities, but if if the reason it's there isn't addressed, as soon as you start resuming the activities, it's just going to return and rear its ugly head. So it, yeah, restoring the function is is ideal. Thank you. Let's see. The audience may be tired because we had a three hour live earlier. Um, there's a question from Georgia. Is that an elliptical a rider behind you? If so, what parts of the body does it work out? So that's an elliptical and well, you're weight bearing. So what's nice about the elliptical is, is you don't have impact. So a lot of the times people don't like impact. I just like different machines so that I, I don't get bored. I mean, I've got a rebounder and my favorite thing is to, to use the road and, and walk or, or run. So, um, but it's nice to have other options. So it's weight bearing, it's gonna work pretty much. And, and if you've got the arms going, it's gonna pretty much work every part of the body, but it's, there's no impact, so. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, Tina says, 
or asks, is pickleball safe for people in their 50s and up? I've heard that it causes a lot of injuries. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if you ever heard of Rancho La Puerta in Tecate, Mexico. This spa I've been teaching at for about 13 years. That's their number one place that people get injured. <laughs> ah, okay. So it's usually not the activity that's at fault. It may be the, and I'm not saying this about that place or anyone else, but it could be the instructor. The instructor is is not preparing people properly. But from my experience in working with a lot of different athletes at all different ages, and you know, I've worked with people over 100 years old. Um, I work with a lot of elderly. I've worked with a lot of teenage athletes. So I think I have a pretty well-rounded understanding of what goes on out there. And what I've found more often than not, the reason people get injured is because their body hasn't been trained properly. And I don't mean in that specific sport or activity. I mean, just warmed up in three plane function. I used to teach all my teenage athletes how to warm up in three planes of motion so that before they hit the court or before they entered the game, their body was ready to do the movements required of it. So I think that's really why so many injuries happen. I know pickleball, as I said earlier, is sort of a friendly sport for older people or people who may not be really super fit because the court's smaller, um, it's a little bit easier to navigate, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people who've injured themselves in pickleball, but we got them back in the game and they loved it and they could play without pain because they had an old issue. They had an old problem that never resolved like an ankle sprain or maybe they had a knee replacement and when they had the knee replacement nobody made sure that their hip was performing properly and it's not and it lacks power so now whenever they go to rotate they're not loading well in the hip and so the low back is unhappy or some other body part so usually that's what it is the body is is not performing well in all three planes and it's it's a lack of warm up and proper training thank you uh, Kelly asks, how long per day should a person do strength and strength training and cardio to age well? How long? Is yeah, that, was that the question? How long? How long for? Okay. So um, that's kind of an, it depends. You don't, there's, there's data that shows for strengthening to literally show muscle growth response, hypertrophy, bigger, stronger muscles. It really does, you don't necessarily, there was one study that showed you could do three workouts a week or you could do one workout a week, but they just tripled the number of sets. So if you did three sets to a, a body part three times a week or nine sets to a body part once a week, they saw the same result. So there's a lot of different studies out there. In my opinion, I think it really matters are you working to fatigue? You don't have to work to where you you literally can't lift it and you're at risk of injury. But if you've done strength training, ideally you're fatigued, you're tired. You're like, whew, okay, I just blasted my legs and now I got to climb those stairs, uh-oh. But we're not talking pain, we're talking fatigue. The muscle has worked and now it kind of wants to rest. So it's, there is no, that's going to be different for every single person. There's no magic number, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. There's no magic number. And whenever we read articles, we always see this. Oh, if you work out for 45 minutes, three times a week. So we want this magic number. But if you really want to get stronger, you need to be fatigued when you're done. And I don't know how long that will take. And it's going to depend on you. Now, me, if I really want to fatigue, I can do like a pyramid set for my, my, my legs and get pretty tired and have to climb the stairs up out of the basement. So, but fatigue is required. That's really what matters most. And then when it comes to aerobics, you want to make sure that it's, uh, you know, from everything I've read, at least 20 minutes. And of course, the longer you go, you're going to get a little bit more benefit, but you want to be in it when it's aerobic, you want to be huffing and puffing a little bit. So what that means is you should, you still want to be able to talk you shouldn't be so breathless you can't talk. But if you can sing, you're not working hard enough. So hopefully that that helps. Thank you. Okay, here is a question from Marcy. Do you recommend rebounding? Well, again, it depends. What is your goal? 
uh, I've got a whole series on my YouTube channel on uh, proper training and what, what it is and what it isn't. And a lot of it has to do with our goals. I know a lot of people, and someone even wrote in and said that she had been injured by uh, doing a particular activity with a trainer because that trainer was used to, to working with a different population for a different reason. So, you know, if, you, if your goal is to be strong, then you want to work with somebody who knows how to get you stronger, but you also want to work with somebody who understands what your particular issues might be. If you have osteoporosis or if you have arthritis or if you have some issues that you need to be aware of, you want to make sure that that trainer knows that and they can modify whatever you're doing so you don't get injured. So it really depends on your goals. A rebounder is great for cardiovascular. You can also do it for strengthening. You can, you can get a, a, I mean, I, I remember one time I did a rebounder workout and whoo, I was blasted. So it, it, it depends. What are your goals? That's going to determine what you're doing on the rebounder for one thing. And then there's different kinds. They've got springs or they've got the, the bungee cords. I like, and I'm not telling you what to get, but personally, I like the bungee cords because they're quieter. I did a lot of research. There's a little bit less, um, a less, re a different response uh, when you're jumping up and down. So um, I preferred that one. But uh, but there's, yeah, there's a ton of of choices out there, and it's like deer in headlights when you're trying to figure out which one. But um, but it can be a great workout. It just depends on what's your goals. Do you train people right where you are in that little room? I do private consulting. Um, I do, I assess their three plane function. We figure out what's not working right. I give them movements to address that. And I make sure that they do them properly and I record it. And then they do that for homework and then we do follow-ups. So that's, that's kind of how it goes. My Academy, I do a live class and I do it right here, down here where I'll teach the movement ed piece of it, all the modifications. And then we literally do the workout together in repetitions, which is a lot of fun. I did that today. Oh, thank yeah, you. I love my academy. Okay. Here's a question. And you can, you can expound on this if you want, maybe even do a show about it because different people have different opinions of, of yoga. And Lena says, do you recommend yoga? And if so, are there any particular types? Because I've heard some, not, not that you're a trainer, I know you're a physical therapist, but I've seen some people say it's not good for people and, you know, things like that, you know, especially certain kinds like yin, which is the kind I like to do because it tends to, they say, make people hyperflexible. So maybe just talk a little bit about yoga if you can. Yeah. Uh, well, I won't talk about things that I don't know. I'm not an expert on yoga. I don't really know all the different types of yoga training. I will tell you from my experience as a clinician, I've worked with many people who've injured themselves doing yoga, but it wasn't because of the yoga. And I'll explain that. Um, sometimes the instructor lacks knowledge. Now I've heard from people that their yoga instructor is so amazing. I, I, there's one of the students in my academy who said that her yoga instructor went down the line and looked at people's feet and knew where they had issues. They, she'd look at their feet and go, you must have back pain and your neck must bother you. And this, so there are some yoga instructors out there that are jaw droppingly skilled and knowledgeable and, and you're going to do really well in their class. And then there are some who they might be a novice. They might've not been trained very well They're And they're not going to make sure that you're modifying, that you're doing what you need to do. So you don't injure yourself. So the level of the skill of the trainer is huge. The, the yoga instructor, that's massively huge. That's number one. Number two, sometimes people don't want to stand out in a class. So they'll do a movement they know they shouldn't do, but they do it anyway because everybody else is doing it. And I've worked with a lot of people who've been injured for that. Uh, I'll never forget one person who said, yeah, when they went to do this move, I knew I shouldn't do it, but everybody else was doing it. So I did it anyway. And as soon as I did it, I could feel the, the, the injury occur. So there's that. And that's not yoga's fault either. So it, it's sort of like, it, it really depends on what is your starting ability when you do any activity. And are you doing something that's beyond your ability and you know you shouldn't? Or the instructor doesn't teach you modifications and doesn't say if anybody's having issues or watch the class. I mean, I see yoga instructors and, and I, I, again, I'm not judging people, but I've seen yoga instructors, they lay on the floor 
and they're just doing the class right along with everybody else. They're not watching anybody. So they don't know if people are hurting themselves, if they're doing it correctly. They're not. I love the instructors who, who you know, they'll demonstrate and then they'll walk around and they'll they'll reposition someone's leg or they'll fix their trunk or they'll they're actually making sure people are doing it correctly and not injuring themselves. So I think that's the biggest thing with yoga. And there's a there's a lot of data that shows that yoga improves things. There's a lot of data that shows that it's very beneficial when it comes to pain, when it comes to strength, when it comes to motion. Now, as far as being hyper-flexible, like you mentioned, AJ, there are, is a, a percentage of the population who's already hyper-flexible. And so if you're already hyper-flexible and you're trying to increase your flexibility, eh, you might really wanna focus a little more on stability. But if you're not hyper-flexible, then you know it, it's, it's not gonna be harmful. So hopefully that kind of cleared some things up. Right. Thank you. Let me look for more questions. If there's, hmm, I'm not seeing any right now. Let me double check. Oh, oh uh, nope. You already answered that one. Well, that's all I see right now today. It's a slow day because we had so many hours of broadcasting already, I think. But you're going to be coming back soon. I can't say why or when, but I'll be seeing you soon. Yes. Yes. The, the fourth week of March, right? Oh, I think, the don't, fourth you have Tuesday. A, don't you have a special one in the next couple of weeks? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Ah, yes. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yes. So you're, you're, next you're, Tuesday you're, at five 30, I think. Yeah. We're going to get a, we're going to get a little bit more that that would be five 30 yes. your time, I believe. Right. Cause I that's yes, my time. Yes. I'm yeah. sorry. Two 30 your time. I don't work that late. Okay. Well, that's terrific. Well, I mean, thank you. But so we can't much. say why. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can say it's just, well, I don't know. I, can we say there's something special it's, going on? It's your show. It's, it's your dime. You say, I know. And I, I don't want Lisa mad at me who I wasn't supposed to say, but just come back because there's going to be a lot of stuff going on on this channel, March 1 through 11. We're going to be doing anywhere from five to 10 shows a day. So, so yes. buckle up guys. Yes. Yes. Um, Susanna said that um, she's made a post saying Eileen is wonderful. I've had a chance to work with her privately. Yeah. Suzanne's a doll. We're, we're, we're mutual admiration society, her and I. <laughs> nice. Yeah, she's a good she's a good student. Whatever you tell her, she does, and that's why she has so much success. That's right. All right. Well, thanks so much, Eileen. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. And, oh, my pleasure too. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at nine a.m. Pacific time for Dr. Lori Marvis, followed at ten a.m. for a special session of the Truth About Weight Loss Summit, Dr. Doug Lyle. And if you'd like to know more about Eileen, just look right beneath the video. It's called Show Notes, and you can work with her in groups privately or just sign up for her.